Hello, everyone. Welcome back. If this is your first uh, talk of the day, welcome to the Premi Health Talks. I'm Fabiana Bacchini, Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, CPBF, and your host for this event. The Premi Health Talks is the first international live series that CPBF is hosting in 2021. These educational sessions are in collaboration with the Family Integrated Care Committee, the Canadian Association of New Nato Nurses, the Canadian New Nato Network, the European Foundation for the Care of Newborn Infants, EFCNI, and GLANS, the Global Alliance for Newborn Care. For those not familiar with CPBF, we are a charitable organization, and our mission is to empower families of premature babies every step of the way through support and education. We believe that through consistent information, access to helpful resources, and peer support inside and outside the NICU, we can empower families, ensuring they are ready to care for their babies. For this Premier Health Talks, we brought health experts from around the world and all over Canada. We've been diving deep into topics affecting Premier Health, from breastfeeding to parental mental health, from the importance of kangaroo care and the best practices to protect your baby's skin. If you need closed captioning, you can watch it live from our YouTube channel and enable closed captioning on the screen. I want to thank our sponsors, Medilla, Water Wipes, and Prolacta uh, from their own, for their ongoing support. Please use the comment area below your screen to ask questions, to share your perspectives and your stories. Today, we already had one session with Diane Schultz on kangaroo care. And if you miss a session, you can watch on our YouTube channel. And next week, all the sessions from this week will be available on our website. And right now, we are going to talk about evidence-based neonatal skincare practices. We'll talk about the latest recommendations for neonatal skincare for preterm and term babies as related to cleansers, bathing, cord care, perineal care, emollients, and oils. And I have here with me joining live from Arkansas, the U.S., uh, Miss Williams. And Miss uh, has been involved in neonatal nursing for the past 16 years and is certified as a high-risk neonatal intensive care nurse. She's currently the Advanced Practice Partner 2 for the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Her current role includes providing theory and evidence-based knowledge to shape practice and core competencies for new native staff, professional development, regulatory compliance, oversight of nurse-sensitive quality indicators, and performance improvement. Nisi has a special interest in mentoring and professional development. She serves on the National Association of Neonatal Nurses Professional Development Committee and is the president-elect of the Arkansas Association of Neonatal Nurses. Missy, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm glad to join you. It's so great to have you. So I know you have a presentation to share with us. I uh, will share the, your slides uh, today. And after your presentation, you have a, uh, some time for Q&A. So please send your questions uh, to Miss, and you're going to address them at the end of the presentation. Here they All righty, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. We're basically just going to be talking about some evidence-based neonatal skincare practices. Um, and then following this presentation, hopefully you'll be able to discuss why premature skin is predisposed to disruptions in skin integrity. We're going to review some recent literature of evidence-based skincare practices for preterm and term infants. And we're going to talk about those latest recommendations for neonatal skincare as Fabiana described, for cleansers, bathing, cord care, perineal care, emollients, oils, and other skincare products. So first we need to do a little dive into some background. Uh, go ahead and move to the next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about the epidermis first. This is our outermost skin layer, and it normally consists of four to five cell layers. The stratum corneum is the outermost layer, and when mature, it's about 20, 10 to 20 layers thick, and it provides barrier functions. So this includes preventing transepidermal water loss and also eva evaporative hypothermia, and it also provides protections from microbes and toxins. Next slide. 
Um, so the epidermis of premature infants is different than that of a term infant or of an adult. So the stratum corneum, that outermost layer, is underdeveloped. And in extremely low birth weight infants, it can be less than two to three layers thick. Um, this um, results in an easy removal of the epidermal layer and also um, reduces barrier function for any infant who's born at less than 34 weeks gestation. This places our premature infants at risk for multiple adverse outcomes. They are at increased risk for greater permeability by noxious agents. They have an increased risk for transepidermal water loss. They have an increased risk for allergen sensitization. They have delayed skin maturation, and then they're at increased risk for skin damage to, from any chemical, mechanical devices, or adhesive-related products, and it also places them at increased risk for infection. Next slide. So the dermis is the next layer of skin, and it's connected to the epidermis by elastic fibers. <coughs> Excuse me. However, in premature infants, they have weaker, fewer, and more widely spaced elastic fibers. They have decreased collagen, and they're also more predisposed to tissue edema. And any tissue edema further weakens the bonds between the epidermal layer and the dermal layer. So they have decreased skin elasticity, and that it increases the risk of skin injury and blistering. Next. So every infant, regardless of gestational age, <coughs> undergoes a skin maturation process. And this occurs through a skin acidification, and it occurs independently of gestational age at birth. So the sweat and oil that are naturally occurring form an acid mantle. The skin pH will lower from a range of 6 to 7 at birth to 5.5 in the first week, and then further drops to five by three weeks of age. The sweat and oil will form that acid mantle and it will protect against some microorganisms as well as reduces transepidermal water loss. By about two to three weeks of age, the barrier function of preterm infants is similar to term infants. Next. So what are the issues? What what things are we looking at when we're talking about skin care and interventions with neonates? Well, after having talked about the epidermis and the dermis, you can see why skin care maintenance and interventions are not without risk in this population. So some of the potential adverse outcomes, some of which we've already talked about, are hospital-acquired infections, allergen sensitization, toxic absorption of chemicals, altered skin appearance, and then in addition to that, infant skin care guidelines are inconsistent and there have been no published guidelines for premature infants. Um, critically ill infants also face additional challenges. Um, so one of the quotes that I like from Kohler says, the goal of evidence-based newborn skin care should be to preserve integrity, prevent toxicity, and avoid exposure of the skin to harmful chemical agents. So what we're gonna talk about is basically a literature review that I did um, looking at articles and asking the question, in preterm and term infants, what are the latest evidence-based skincare guidelines? So this search was of multiple medical databases, um, that looked at skincare guidelines and infants. The articles were filtered to only include those that were published within the last five years that were full text articles, and it excluded some specific items such as kangaroo care, um, which while it does involve skin, is not specific to skin care practices. Um, and after all of that, and after comparing what were duplicative items and reading the abstracts, 12 articles were selected to be included in this literature review. Next. So the first article we're going to talk about is infant skincare products. What are the issues? 
So this was a literature review, and the goal of this article was to provide evidence-based information to educate parents on the use of products for preterm and term infants. Next. And what the authors found was that there was little scientific evidence to support the safety of natural or organic products on infant skin. And this was due to the fact that the origination of raw materials from different sources made it difficult to test and then compare ingredients. There's also an abundance of non-scientific information, which makes it challenging for parents to navigate choices when they're looking at various products. Uh, compared to soaps and detergents, cleansers formulated for infant skin do not disrupt the infant's acid mantle or skin barrier. And oils lower in oleic acid content have a lower risk of irritant contact dermatitis. The next article that we're going to look at is Extremely Preterm Infant Skin Care, a Transformation of Practice Aimed to Prevent Harm. This was a quality improvement project, and the authors described a harm prevention or consequence-centered approach to skin care to help facilitate safer practice methods for extremely premature infants. What the authors found was that current literature for skin care of extremely premature infants was scarce. However, they were able to extract some clinical practice pearls and apply them to their NICU to promote safer skin care practices. The next article we're going to talk about is infant skin care updates and recommendations. The purpose of this article was to review some research updates and current skin care recommendations for term infants preterm infants, as well as any infants born with genetic skin disorders. Next, what the authors found was that delaying the first bath offers multiple benefits for term infants, that swaddle bathing every four days for preterm infants is an effective strategy, and that infants with a family history of atopic dermatitis benefit from regular application of a bland skin moisturizer. The next article we're going to look at is evidence-based skin care in preterm infants. Uh, this was a literature review, the purpose of which to, was to address skin barrier maintenance in preterm, very preterm, and extremely preterm infants. And what the authors found was that plastic wraps, humidified incubators, air drying the umbilical cord, and tub bathing every fourth day were supported. However, there was conflicting information about the use of emollients. In developed countries, topical petroleum resulted in increased rates of candidemia and coagulase negative staphylococcus infection. However, in developing countries, preterm infants exhibited reduced um, nosocomial or inquired infections, and they had improved skin conditions. Next, we're going to look at bathing and beyond current bathing controversies for newborn infants. This was a literature review, and they reviewed the literature about newborn bathing as well as the controversies of daily CHG baths for NICU patients. What the author found was that delaying the first bath after delivery offers multiple benefits, including improved breastfeeding that tub bathing maintains temperature better and is less stressful than other methods, that premature bathed infants can be bathed as infrequently as every four days without an increase in skin colonization. Next, we're gonna look at the recommendations from a European Roundtable meeting on best practice healthy infant skin care. These were European Roundtable recommendations, and this was an update from material that was originally published in 2009 in light of new evidence. And what the authors found, and there's too many recommendations to list here um, individually, was, um, for example, they changed their recommendation from wiping the infant with water immediately after delivery to the infant can be wiped preferably with a dry towel. And they changed the wording of healthcare workers wearing gloves during the first bath from should to ideal. Um, however, this um, is against um, CDC recommendations, which recommend that gloves should always be worn as standard precautions 
when it's reasonably anticipated that contact with a blood or other potentially infectious material is going to occur. The authors also listed the evidence strength for many of their recommendations as low quality. Next, we're going to look at umbilical cord care in the newborn infant. This was a clinical report, and the purpose was to review the evidence supporting recommendations of umbilical cord care in different clinical settings. The author found that authors found that the umbilical cord should be cut with a sterile blade or scissors, preferably using sterile gloves. That dry cord care is preferable under most circumstances in high resource countries. That application of topical chlorhexidine is recommended for those born outside the hospital setting where hygienic conditions are poor and or where infection rates are high. Next, we're going to look at skin care practices in newborn nurseries and mother baby units in Maryland. This was a survey of skin care practices in newborn nurseries and mother baby units. And then they then took those survey results and assessed them against a literature review. And this helped them to evaluate current practice and then provide a summary of recommendations based upon that analysis of the current literature. What the authors found was they were able to get a very large response and um, they received responses from over 90% of the nurseries. A lot of their questions centered around bathing, removal of the vernix um, after delivery and skincare products. And what the authors found was that the practice varied among various hospitals and it was often not evidence-based or in fact was contrary to the literature. Next, we're going to look at neonatal skin care, developments in care to maintain neonatal barrier function and prevention of diaper dermatitis. This was a literature review um, to evaluate current practice and provide a summary of recommendations based upon analysis of the current literature. What the authors found was that superabsorbent diapers reduce moisture in the incidence of diaper dermatitis that barrier creams aid in prevention and treatment of diaper dermatitis, but do not replace the need for frequent diaper changes. Um, and current literature did not support one cleansing method over another. Next, um, a quality improvement approach to perineal skincare. This was the use of standardized guidelines and novel diaper wipes to reduce diaper dermatitis in NICU infants. This is a quality improvement project um, the authors implemented perineal skincare guidelines, which included novel diaper wipes to decrease the incidence of diaper dermatitis by 20% within one year. And what the authors found was that the incidence of diaper dermatitis decreased by 16.7%. The incidence of severe diaper dermatitis decreased by 34.9% and the duration of severe diaper dermatitis decreased from 6.1 to 2.6 days per, per 100 patient days. And there was not a subsequent increase in uh, fungal skin infections during this time. Next, we're gonna look at the basics, which was the Baby Skin Integrity Comparison Survey Study. This was a prospective experimental study and the authors um, designed it to compare three different brands of baby wipes and they used maternal observations of the incidence of irritant diaper dermatitis in infants from birth to eight weeks of age. What the authors found was that babies who were cleaned with the brand with fewest ingredients had significantly fewer days of rash. The first, this was the first research of its kind, which revealed that different formulations of baby wipes can impact the skin integrity of infants. And there was a highly significant brand effect noted. Next, we're gonna look at topical emollients for preventing infection in preterm infants. This was a Cochrane review to assess the effect of topical application of emollients on the incidence of invasive infection in preterm infants. What the authors found was that there was 18 eligible primary publications included, and in that there was a total of 3,089 infants which participated in the trials. There was no evidence of a difference in incidence of invasive infection or mortality. 
So what are we going to do with all this information? How do we synthesize that together? Together. So that's what we're going to talk about next. So for cleansers, what their research supported was that we should use a liquid mild formulation for infants with a pH of four to seven. The use of soaps or detergents is highly discouraged as their alkaline nature can disrupt that skin's acid mantle, resulting in roughness, dryness, and flaking of the skin. You should use a product with minimal dyes and fragrances. And for infants who are born at less than 20 Uh, we lost uh, Misty's audio. I'll be back in a, just a few minutes as soon as we recover her audio. Stay with us. Okay. I don't know where we cut off at. I'll repeat the last part. So um, ocular safety is an important consideration and this is because infants do not readily blink to protect their eyes until they're about four months of age. So bathing frequency what the research supported was that delaying the first bath until 12 to 24 hours of life is beneficial for healthy term infants or is culturally appropriate. This increases parental bo bonding and breastfeeding success, and it helps retain the vernix caseosa. Um, however, bathing earlier may be indicated in cases of heavy meconium staining, excessive blood, um, or in the presence of some maternal infections. Um, however, you want to ensure that temperature and cardiorespiratory status should be stable prior to the first bath. Um, the retention of this vernix caseosa has multiple benefits for the infant, including protection from infection. It also contributes to the development of the acid mantle barrier and helps improve skin barrier function. Research also supports that bathing two to three times per week is sufficient and additional bathing can actually disrupt skin barrier function and increase bacterial skin flora. So next we want to talk about bathing methods. So tub bathing is preferred over sponge bathing, especially for preterm infants. It's less likely to cause body temperature variability. It helps minimize the physiological stress associated with bathing. Uh, swaddle bathing can also help reduce intense motor reactions seen during bathing. And immersion bathing prior to cord separation has also been found to be safe. So for CHG bathing, the research found that daily CHG bathing does support um, the reduction of bloodstream infections. However, there's a lack of research and information about whether CHG crosses the blood-brain barrier, um, and there's an unknown neurotoxicity or neurological impact. Um, studies have shown that after uh, topical exposure to low concentrations, that preterm infants who were greater than 1,500 grams and greater than seven days old had demonstrated detectable serum levels from systemic absorption. And the risk for systemic absorption is higher in preterm infants with poor skin integrity. So there's definitely more research that's needed in this area. Next, we're gonna talk about umbilical cord care. So you always wanna to try to keep the cord clean and dry. The umbilical cord can be a common entry point for pathogenic bacteria with Staphylococcus aureus being the most frequently reported organism. Um, antibacterial, antimicrobial agents in the hospital setting are not recommended, and this is because reducing bacterial colonization can actually lead to the selection of more virulent bacterial pathogens. Instead, you want to expose the umbilical cord to air or loosely cover it with a cloth. If it becomes soiled, you can clean it with soap and sterile water. 
You want to fold the diaper down below the cord. And you can promote colonization of non-pathogenic bacteria by allowing the healthy infant to room in and be colonized with the mother's normal skin flora. And next we're going to talk about diaper dermatitis. So this is a broad term used to describe inflamed skin and lesions in the diaper area. Um, and this is a common area that you see um, rashes develop because it's subject to urine, feces, friction, microbes, and then chemicals from skincare products. It can vary in severity, but the majority is classified as irritant contact dermatitis. And infants who have diaper dermatitis often display emotional and physical distress. This can include behavioral changes such as increased crying, agitation, and changes in feeding and sleep patterns. So how frequently do we see diaper dermatitis? It's actually very common. Um, estimates in the literature range from 25 to 100% of infants prior to age two will experience diaper dermatitis, and the reported incidence in the NICU varies from 21 to 25%. Um, infants who receive antibiotics or on fortified diets or have prenatal exposure to illicit drugs also have an increased risk of diaper dermatitis, and this is due to altered gut flora, stool composition, and an increase in stooling frequency. So how can we prevent diaper dermatitis? Uh, the use of super absorbent diapers, this helps reduce moisture at the skin level, changing the diaper frequently, gently removing any urine or stool as friction can disrupt the skin layers and actually cause more damage. Uh, disposable diaper wipes have been shown in multiple studies to be superior to cotton wool and water because the pH buffers in the wipes may actually counteract the alkaline urine and restore normal skin pH. They're also appropriate for medically stable NICU patients, um, but they should be free of any potential irritants such as alcohol, fragrance, essential oils, soaps, and harsh detergents. Uh, barrier creams are an effective element of full-term infant skin management. Uh, zinc and petroleum-based products are the most effective. Um, they're controversial, however, in extreme premature infants due to the risk for systemic absorption, and they're often used to treat diaper dermatitis. Emollients are topical agents usually made of fat or oil that are designed to soften and smooth the skin. They help inhibit water loss, but they may contain fragrances or other skin sensitizing agents. So some recommendations for their usage are to apply in a thin layer, avoiding any skin folds. Do not double dip the product. So if you're applying them, um, get product out of the container, apply it to the infant. Once you've touched the infant, don't go back into the container um, to get more product. Um, this is beneficial for infants with structural skin changes, such as dryness or flaking, those who have a family history of eczema or atopic dermatitis. Um, and as I mentioned before, you don't want to use any petroleum-based products for extremely premature infants. And this is because of the increased risk of coagulase negative staphylococcal infections in extremely low birth weight infants. Um, oils may also have multiple uh, benefits for neonatal skin care. This includes antimicrobial activity, anti-inflammatory properties, reduction of transepidermal water loss, and growth improvement. Um, oils with the lowest oleic acid and the highest linoleic acid had the most associated benefit. However, mustard, vegetable, and olive oil should be avoided as they delay development of the skin barrier. There's also numerous other natural oils that should be avoided um, for other reasons. Uh, for example, lavender and tea tree oil can cause gynecomastia in boys prior to puberty and should be avoided. Eucalyptus, sage, and tr tea tree oil can also be toxic depending on blood levels. And lavender, peppermint, and jasmine oil have been associated with allergic contact dermatitis and should be avoided. 
So more information is needed about the safety of products used on infant skin. We are sorely needing research on treatments and guidelines for premature infants. Um, and we need to have a subclassification by gestational age for these infants. So in conclusion, neonatal skin, especially that of preterm infants, is subject to adverse outcomes. Uh, risk reduction strategies combined with standardized evidence-based skincare guidelines offer the best known outcomes for this population. And any guidelines developed should be adjusted based upon gestational age. And safety and efficacy for infant skincare products is a priority. Wrong person I brought to back here. Uh, Missy, that thank concludes you so my much. presentation. So um, if we have any questions. Missy, thank you so much for sharing with us. I think it is so important for um, families and professionals to know uh, this information. Uh, I have a few questions for you, actually, because you mentioned uh, bathing and the frequency of bathing every four days. Uh, and a lot of families ask us about that. Is this the same um, recommendation for after discharge? Yes. So in the, especially in the initial period after um, you've went home with your baby, because if you bathe too frequently, um, you're going to get that dryness and roughness and flaking of the skin. Now, obviously, if you have an infant who, you know, threw up all over themselves or, you know, they had one of those blowout diapers that we all know babies have, um, you, of course, want to bathe. So it's the recommendation is two to three times a week or as needed. Um, so if you have something like that happen, then obviously you want to go ahead and bathe and get that baby cleaned up. Okay, uh, I think the next question to you is when the baby is in the ICU, obviously, depends on the gestational age of, okay, there's some noise on your computer. Yeah, I'm trying to move that away from there. Maybe that'll help. Okay, that's better. Uh, when the baby is in the ICU, um, you, you make every four days, but there's a lot of foam bathing in the ICU early in the days, not necessarily put the baby in water. I'm sorry, I missed that question. I don't know if it was because I was too close to my computer. Okay, no, my uh, my uh, question was in regards to uh, in the ICU, the way the, the baby is receiving the bath. Uh, in the early days, I think it's important to tell parents that the babies do not go inside a, ba uh, a bathtub or a little container that baby can actually be in the water, but it's more like a sponge bath and parents get involved in that as well. Yeah, so our recommendation is always to get parents involved. And we don't typically put the infant in a tub in the beginning. But once um, the baby has gotten to the point where, like, they don't have an IV and they're stable, um, swaddle bathing is always recommended for that population. And parents are always welcome to join in that point. Um, swaddle bathing for that population is actually um, very relaxing for the baby, can be very enjoyable. And the baby doesn't have to be in an open crib or a bassinet um, to have a swaddle bath. They can still be in an isolate. Oh, that is very interesting. So there's a question here. Uh, if they develop a diaper in the ICU, are they more prone to develop at a later age? I'm sorry, I missed part of that question. If a baby develops diaper dermatitis in their ICU, are they more prone to develop dermatitis at a later age? Um, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't. I didn't see any research that said if they develop diaper dermatitis in the NICU that they were more prone to develop it later on. I think some of the treatment that we do in the NICU can contribute to diaper dermatitis simply because. Miss, we are losing your audio. And that can trade you. Sorry, your your audio cut off, Missy. Sorry, we we lost your audio. Sorry, I was gonna say um, I didn't see a correlation between uh, the occurrence of diaper dermatitis in the NICU with diaper dermatitis later outside of the NICU. 
NICU um, just because there's things that occur in the NICU, such as antibiotic administration um, that can alter your gut flora, that can make you more prone to getting diaper dermatitis. And once, once an infant is at home, and no longer receiving antibiotics or the other things that may have contributed to the diaper dermatitis, you may see that clear up. Okay, and in terms of your other recommendations of dries and fragrance products, uh, barrier creams, and all that they're not, not using petroleum based products, are all those recommendations also apply for the babies after this time, independent of the gestational age they were born? Oh, I'm sorry, I completely lost that whole question. I don't know what happened to our connection, but yeah, I know your audio is really bad. If maybe you can just hold your phone with your hand. Okay, is it better now? No, I think the last question is all those recommendations that you mentioned, are they applicable for after this time? So independent of when the station or age the baby was born? Um, no, some of them do not because the acid mantle barrier develops independently of your gestational age. So if you were born at 24 weeks um, or if you were born at 32 weeks, by that two to three week age period, you will have keratinized skin. Um, now granted, a 20 24 weeker and a 32 weeker will be a little bit differently, even at two to three weeks of age. But by discharge, there's not really any different differentiation in the um, the thickness of their skin barrier. That is great. Uh, I'm sharing the PDF email you're here. If people have more questions, they will send it to us, and then we can uh, reply to them. Okay. So okay, but I really want to thank you for joining us here today and share your information with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And for all of you watching us here today and this entire week, either on Facebook or on our YouTube channel, uh, thank you for joining us. We have an international audience, people joining us from all over the world. If you missed one of the 11 talks that we had this week, you can watch the recordings on our YouTube channel or next week they will be available on our website, which is right here, the Canadian premis.org. I want to thank our sponsors, Medilla, Water Wipes, and Prolacta Bioscience for their ongoing support. And also I want to thank our CPBF communications team, Patricia, Camila, Marianne, and Felipe for the hard work uh, to create this week uh, for us and uh, this incredible library of content that you've built uh, over the last year, actually. So CPBF is a registered charity and 100% of all our donations received this week, go to our support programs for families. To donate, you can go to the CanadianPremies.org. Together, we can create a brighter future to all premature babies and their families. And next week, I will resume our Premie Chats every Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can watch us live on our YouTube channel or Facebook. Thank you, everyone. I see you soon and stay well.